Yes, this uh, study, uh, we're going to add this to the um, study we did on the um, sale of Mount Carmel by and the purchase of New Mount Carmel by Victor Hodif and Florence Hodif. And um, there are many people that believe that Florence Hodif um, was not told by Victor Hodif to be the vice president before he died. So they have um, basically um, bore false witness, so to speak, and uh, condemned her and um, basically said that she was lying and uh, that she was not appointed by Victor Hodif. And what happened was the executive council denied her um, that she was telling the truth, that Victor Hodif did appoint her as the vice president before he died so that she could finish the work that he and she started in the per in the selling of old Mount Carmel and in the purchase of new Mount Carmel. Because I believe Rector Hodder saw this saw Mount Car new Mount Carmel and he told her that this is what the Lord wanted to purchase with the sale of the excess and then the whole of old Mount Carmel and that's what she did she sold it and she bought new Mount Carmel and yes she tried selling an old uh, new Mount Carmel as well but there was a reason for that as well so I believe that Florence Hodif was doing the Lord's will even in selling old Mount Carmel and purchasing new Mount Carmel and then trying to sell it again but above all she was doing the Lord's will in disbanding the Davidian Association when it became defunct after Victor Hodder's death and because she was the vice president and his wife she had a right to disband it but of course the executive council because they don't want to progress with what the Lord is doing, they decided to um, set up their own association without a prophet president, you see, denying Vic, uh, Victor Hodif's choice, basically, of Florence, but he also gave Ben Roden, who was a Davidian as well, he gave Ben and Lois Roden a lifetime membership card which no one else had and he never gave anyone else a lifetime membership card so that kind of uh, tells you something about who he thought Ben and Lois Roden were the Lord had to tell him to do that because and he's the only one that can um, give out the cards you see, it's only the president that does that, not the vice president like we have now. Uh, the membership cards have to be given by the president because the, the, he is anointed and appointed to do so. No one else. And if anyone else is doing it, they're doing it fraudulently and they're doing it um, outside the bylaws of the church that were set up by the Lord through his prophets. So I'm going to read to you from Symbolic Code. The title of this uh, section is Judge Not Another Man's Servant. Okay? And the first part of it uh, goes through the various uh, marriages and um, partnerships uh, in the scriptures that... Um, the Lord ordained 
they may have been questionable uh, to our self-righteous uh, human uh, opinion and devising, but to God, the Lord had his purpose in doing these things. And so Victor Hadif wrote this because he was making comment on how others were regarding his marriage uh, to Florence. So I'm going to uh, jump down to where he begins to talk about his own marriage after he talked about the marriages of other men uh, that the Lord used uh, and their account is in the scriptures. So I'm going to go ahead here. This is on page 8 of Symbolic Code, Volume 3, Number 5 and 6, page 8. Brother Hodder's marriage is far more in accordance with the accepted customs of today than were the above marriages in their day. Abraham's case alone is sufficient to satisfy those whom the truth can convince. Moreover, as God knew beforehand what Brother Hadif was going to do, then were his marriage to cast reproach upon the purifying message, thereby causing anyone to lose eternal life, God, for that one's life and for his own honor, would not have entrusted his message to Brother Hadif. So he's basically saying, who do you people think you are in questioning uh, what God told Brother Hadif uh, who to marry? And I'll go even a step further, uh, who he appointed to be the vice president because he knew he might die. So he made his wife instead of Wilson because Wilson was the vice president at that time, and even a vice president and all the members of the executive council don't have a lifetime membership, okay? Uh, they're chosen every year. Or, in this case, whenever the Lord tells the president uh, when to appoint someone else, in their stead. And that's what he did. So, still further, inasmuch as God has continued to reveal truth through Brother Hadif since his marriage, now remember, Brother Hadif's writing this, okay? There should be no reason for anyone to doubt that God not only approved of his marriage, but also led him to take this step. You know, there's a lot of question about this because of uh, her age. I think she was 17, um, 19. Uh, so uh, it doesn't matter if God asked him to marry her because he wanted her to outlive him and to maybe outlive the controversy that was going on within the Davidian movement so that she would be a first-hand witness of what went on and to bear a testimony against those that went about to do their own will in reorganizing, reorganizing outside the bylaws of the uh, association and not accepting the one that the Lord appointed and anointed, Ben Roden, who was the next prophet president of God's work, the Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association. Those who believe some reason that in ancient times people lived longer than they do now, and that therefore great differences in the ages of husband and wife were then permissible. However, we see no logic in such reasoning. For though the man lived longer 
than he now does, yet the woman also lived longer in those days than she does today. Those who believe in present truth yet continue to find fault with Brother Hodef's marriage prove to us one of two things, either that they are shallow thinkers or that they have no faith in what they believe for the message teaches that we, as part of the 144,000, shall never die. Therefore, if God has ever had reason to sanction marriages involving great differences of ages, he must certainly have now. The trouble is not with Brother Hodif's marriage, but rather with those who judge Brother Hodif by their own standards. Now, if Brother Hodif was to be one of the 144,000, then Brother Hodif should not have died. I say the same about Ben Roden and Lois Roden. Then there must have been something about their message that did not give them the truth so that they could be translated without seeing death. There had to be more additional truth to Brother Hodef's message, Brother Roden's message, and Lois Roden's message, because they all died. So you have to look at that. But that's not what we're considering right now. What we're considering is why there was such a difference, an age difference, in Brother Hodef's and Florence Hodef's ages, and they got married. But Brother Hodef's critics seem utterly to forget that he has a tremendous work and that he does not need a wife able only to make a home for him, but rather one most able to assist him in his work. Hence, an aged woman, or one without experience in the work, would be to him a hindrance rather than a help. Therefore, God has provided for him a helpmeet that will really help him, as he cannot successfully carry on the work while single. We have already seen that in most cases, the root of the trouble lies either with those who profess to be friends of the cause of truth, but who themselves were not walking in the light before the sealing message found them and are not doing so now, or with those who have openly been doing everything to make the truth of non-effect. Some of these, while professing to believe, have opposed every advanced step which the message has made while others have, on the one hand, divorced their first wives and married again, and, on the other hand, either objected to Brother Hodef's getting married or felt hurt because he did not take them into counsel to decide for him whom he should marry. Still others have married outside the truth, which facts prove that by their own sins they have been blinded and that as they zealously pick flaws in those who have the words of life for them, they are instead of reforming only descending deeper into darkness. This is Satan's most effective way of working for by so doing he is able to keep them in their sins away from the flock that flow, follows the Good Shepherd's voice. The greatest trouble with most SDAs is that they are baptized in the name of the denomination rather than in the name of the Trinity. Consequently, if they see that the church is doing something which to them is not pleasing, they withdraw themselves from its fellowship, renounce the truth, and thus turn their backs on eternal life, 
to face eternal death. Whereas, if Christ calls them to follow him, and the church hears not his voice, they turn against him to follow the church. My brethren, make your decision on the merits of the message itself, rather than on the Brother Hodif's good or bad deeds. Uh, people need to take that to heart today as well. Don't criticize the message because of the messenger's character or his family's character. You have to allow the message to be um, to stand on its own. If it's the truth, it will stand on its own. God has not delegated anyone of you to decide for him Brother Hodif's marriage. Neither has he instructed any of you to take as a criterion in setting your own case Brother Hodif's marriage. Who knows but what God is testing you? Who, like Peter, thought that you would stand with the message regardless of what might come? but who are now showing your true relation to it. We trust that you will no longer allow the great deceiver Satan to confuse your mind and thus cause you falsely to accuse us or to doubt that which goes from this office. God's counsel to you is, Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? Arise, shine, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Behold the mount upon the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no law more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. I am 115. Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Hence, do not be found among those who attempt to steady the ark, or who may say, you are too earnest, you do not interpret the scriptures in the proper way. Let me tell you how to teach your message. Testimonies to Ministers page 475. I get the same problem arising with those that are claiming to be believers in the present truth, yet they will not accept what the Lord is saying through his anointed servant, the Joshua of today. Whatever it may be, whether it's the calendar, whether it's the Sabbath, whether it's moving to Mount Carmel, they're not going to listen. They're going to do their own thing. Let me tell you how to teach your message. They'll give you all kinds of quotations from the um, spirit of prophecy as if they're going to tell you something you already don't know or the spirit has overlooked, you see, because, uh, you know, if a person is anointed and appointed of God, uh, do you think the Holy Spirit who's speaking through them doesn't know what the Holy Spirit has already said and had others write throughout the ages? I think so. But these others want to, you see, you are too earnest, you do not interpret the scriptures in the proper way in the proper way that I want to hear it, you see. So let me tell you how to teach your message. Take your eyes off Brother Hodif, Brother Roden, Sister Roden, Florence Hodif, see. 
even Vernon Howell, and look unto the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, Yahshua, through the message he sends, through the messenger he sends. Christ in the messenger whom he sends. So take your eyes off of the ones that the Lord has anointed and appointed and look unto Yahshua through the message he sends. Anyone doubting the message because of Brother Hodif's marriage would show not only great weakness, but also that he is following Brother Hodif instead of the message. Instead of the message. Now we've got people today that call themselves ministers of the Davidian movement, and I believe they're self-appointed because Brother Hodif didn't appoint them, nor did the Lord's vicegerent uh, appoint them. So they're self-proclaimed. And these are individuals that think they should have reorganized the defunct organization that was defunct after Victor Hodef's death and Florence Hodef, who had a right and was told not only by Victor Hodef, but by the Holy Spirit, to disband the movement. Why? Because there was no prophet president. He died. And anyone coming with a new message would have to have been appointed by the Lord himself to carry on the work. Therefore, he would have to have a new name. A new message has to have a new name by which to be known by. So when Victor Hodef died, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist movement was defunct. And it was really disbanded by Florence Hodef, the vice president. When Ben Roden was given the new message of the branch, who brings this revival, this reformation, this great change that Victor Hodef prophesied would come? Victor Hodef claimed that he had the message likened unto John the Baptist. And John the Baptist prepared the way for Christ. And when Christ came, he said, I must decrease so that he must increase. So Victor Hodef, who gave Ben Roden and Lois Roden a lifetime membership card, knew, I believe in his heart of hearts, that Ben and Lois were going to take up the work when he died. And Florence was not a prophet, so she couldn't be a president, but she could be a vice president. And because of their marriage, and because they are one flesh in marriage, Victor Hodef had a right to turn the reins over to his wife. Now, we are told that uh, he, before he died, she was there visiting him. He, he, he looked like he was going to recover. It looked like he was going to come out the next day. And they were talking about the 42-month prophecy. And she had asked him the question. Uh, you know, she wanted an answer, whether it, when it was going to happen or when it was going to transpire. And he basically told her, I'll give you the answer tomorrow. Well, through the night, he died. Rather suddenly, they thought he was going to come out. But he still appointed her as the vice president. Whether he thought he was going to die or whether she thought he was going to die or not, or whether anybody thought he was going to die or not, the Holy Spirit had him do that. So she was anointed 
as the vice president by the anointed president. And she was to finish the work that she was privy to. It was nothing it was not anyone else's business. And that's what I get from what Brother Hodiff was basically saying here. It was none of your business who I married, and it's none of your business what I shared with my wife about God's business and the work that I had to do. It's none of your business, period. You have not no right to judge another man's servant, just like you had no right to judge Ben Roden, another man's servant. He was really Brother Hot of servant, you know. He appointed him and gave him a lifetime membership, both he and his wife. Now, when Ben Roden came back from Israel, after they had set up a vegetarian village in the hills of Amarim, and he had granted to him by the Israeli government, if he could bring the people, they would give him the land. The land was free, but they had to settle it. They had to build it. So they had to have finances to do that. So he came back to Waco, New Mount Carmel. When the Davidians were gathered here at New Mount Carmel, after they had sold Old Mount Carmel, bought this property, and gathered here waiting for the 42-month prophecy as they thought it would be fulfilled, they came to wait for it to be fulfilled on Mount Carmel, New Mount Carmel. And they gathered here. There was about 1,200 of them waiting for God's chariot to come and pick them up and take them over to Israel to establish the kingdom. Now, Ben Roden, the verse in Amos, um, First Amos 1 and 2, uh, saying that the Lord roared from Zion and he came from Jerusalem and he roared from Zion. Okay, And Ben Roden came from Jerusalem. He actually flew back at this time, at this appointed time, that this was about to be fulfilled. And he came with the message to them. The chariot isn't coming to take you to Israel. You are to liquidate, sell New Mount Carmel, and buy your tickets and take the treasure that you have left over from the sale of New Mount Carmel and fly to Israel on LL Airlines, which is the Israeli public airlines, and go to Israel. There's enough land there waiting for you. Enough land for 150,000 people. If you'll go and claim the land, claim the kingdom, buy the kingdom, sell all that you have and buy the kingdom. No one has ever done that yet. Sell all that they have to buy the kingdom. And that's what God requires. That you sell all that you have and buy the kingdom. Wherever he places his name. Wherever he places the kingdom. You are to sell all that you have and use that to acquire the kingdom for yourself. Now what does that mean? To you today. That means that if you're living away from the property that the Lord has designated 
to gather his people before they go to Israel, which would be New Mount Carmel. New Mount Carmel is still here. It was bought. It was preserved by Ben Roden because when Florence Hodef realized that her prophecy, the 42-month prophecy, was not fulfilled as she had predicted and those that were in the general executive council of the defunct okay, association, they didn't have inspiration. Victor Hodov had inspiration. And because the 42-month prophecy was not fulfilled like they thought it would be, they were disappointed. Yes, there was a disappointment. But the disappointment was to God that they did not listen to his vicegerent, Ben Roden, and sell what they had so that they go to Israel and buy the kingdom. Use the money to establish villages, you see, and places where they could live. There was enough land granted for the 144,000, see, plus 6,000, uh, let's see, 56,000, 5,600 people extra. Wave sheaf. 144,000, 150,000 people. So you, uh, you tell me whether uh, they should be disappointed. Yes, that was a great disappointment. They could have been in the kingdom. Well, they did the same thing in 1888, you know, when they rejected the uh, message that came because it didn't come the way they wanted it to. And they rejected it. But if they had have accepted what Jones and Wagner were teaching about the righteousness of Christ, the impartation of the righteousness of Christ, and they began to look at the uh, uh, truth about how Christ, the only begotten Son, was born in heaven before he was born in the earth. That meant that there was a divine mother. If he was born in heaven and begotten in heaven before he was born again in the earth, the Spirit began to open up to uh, the leaders of the Advent movement that the Holy Spirit is feminine and that God is a family, a father, mother, and a son. But they weren't willing to progress with that light. So the angel left because it was ridiculed, rejected, and made fun of by the majority. So the, that message, see about the righteousness of Christ, about the kingdom, about the family of God, had to come back again and be repeated. It came back and after 40 uh, years, the Advent movement and its leaders wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, from 1890, because that's when they would have been in the kingdom. See, when they left Egypt, they could have been in the kingdom within seven days. They could have been in but they wandered for 40 years. Why? Because of their murmuring and complaining. Because they wouldn't accept the message the way God wanted them to receive it. Through Moses. And then through Joshua, you see. But they wouldn't receive it. So he had to take them not only out of Egypt, but he had to take Egypt out of them. And all that was left were two that came out of Egypt, Joshua and Caleb, that went into the land and were able to settle it. Well, Seventh-day Adventists didn't want to go to Israel, didn't want to set up the kingdom. Back in 1890, 40 years of wilderness wandering. Then we had Victor Hodd of coming in 1929, preparing the way for the kingdom and the king, like John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way for the Lord, hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it, 
Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? In other words, he was a man sent of God. But he was also preparing the way for another one, another man coming that was sent of God. And you don't have to be a genius or even inspired to see that Ben Roden and Lois Roden, because they were given a lifetime membership card by Victor Hodoff, he's the only one that could have done that legally, according to the bylaws of the church. So he was announcing, just like John the Baptist announced who Christ was. Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. He was basically saying, behold, Ben Roden. See? Ben means son. Roden means <laughs> out of the rod. A son, Ben El, a son of God out of the rod. Isn't that something? Ben El Roden is his name. So he was the son of God that came out of the rod. But Davidians couldn't see that, you see, because they don't see with spiritual eyes. They see in the flesh. So they rejected him. When he came to tell them to go to the kingdom. And he had it all ready for them. All they had to do was sell Mount Carmel, new Mount Carmel, take the money, buy their plane tickets, go to Israel, and the Israeli government would have given them land. They would have made Aliyah. In other words, the going up. They would have made the uh, trip. See? And they don't usually do that for Christians. They only do it for Jews. But he told them that I have your brothers and sisters of the ten tribes from the tribe of Ephraim. And they'll come here and they'll settle this land. They made Ben Road not to be a liar. Because they wouldn't step up to the call. Because it didn't work out their way. Did you think the kingdom was not going to take all that we have and all that we are for it to be established in this earth? Of course. Because that's what it took for Christ. He gave up everything that he had in heaven. Everything. And became a babe a son of man, a son of Adam, so that he could liberate Adam and his offspring from being condemned to an eternal death. And he gave up his eternal life so that he could pass his eternal life on to us so that we don't have to die but live when we are resurrected by that power of resurrection and life that he gave up, the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah. He wants to put his spirit within us because that's what Adam and Eve gave up. When they lived in the garden and they were obedient, you know that they didn't have to work like we work today to make uh, a living it was when they were cast out of the garden that Adam was sentenced, basically, to uh, till the land by the sweat of his brow so he can bring forth food. They had all the food they wanted in the garden. They ate from the tree of life. But they had to go and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what was forbidden them. And then... They were cast out of the garden. They couldn't keep the true Sabbath or the Sabbath in a true way. You understand? Because that is resting from your labors, 
from what you're doing. Well, out here, outside the garden, we've got to work. Work, work, six days a week. See? And what Pharaoh made the children of Israel to do was work seven days a week. So they lost sight of the Sabbath. They didn't know when the Sabbath was. So when they came out of Egypt, the Lord had to tell them when the Sabbath was. He had to tell them. You couldn't figure it out. You had to be told. But because they came out of Egypt and were still in the wilderness, I don't believe they were given the true Sabbath. They were given the Sabbath the way it is in this earth. They were not given that heavenly rest that you can only have when you're in the kingdom of heaven, even the kingdom of heaven on earth. But it's still the kingdom of heaven. It's not, it's not, it's not what you would um, receive while you're in the earth unless you're delivered from this kingdom of the earth. You see, this kingdom that's on the earth. And go back into the garden. Go back into the kingdom of God. And rest in him. And rest in her. Continually. Daily. Continually. Resting from your own labor. Resting from your own ideas, habits, and practices. Resting in Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. And in the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is truly the Sabbath. If he's the Lord of the Sabbath, the husband of the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is regarded uh, by the Jews as, my, as a bride coming, and the man and the woman come together on that day. That's when Adam and Eve were married. They were married on the Sabbath. They consummated their marriage on the Sabbath. Their wedding was on the Sabbath. And their honeymoon was on the Sabbath. In other words, they consummated their marriage by becoming one in the act of love. They consummated the marriage, you see, on the Sabbath. So being in love, being at rest, being at one, being in communion, you see, not only with one another, but with our creators and with our children and with our family, you see, the Sabbath is a family thing. And you see, the Davidians couldn't see that Brother Hadif was resting in the Lord when he was married to Florence. They had to say something about it, you see. They couldn't leave him alone. They couldn't give him the peace and the rest that he found in marrying her. Do you understand this? And having a helpmate. They had to question it. They had to question it. But he was in God's order. He was under God in doing what he did. So we have no idea what it means to be in the kingdom, what it means to be keeping the Sabbaths, the weekly and the yearly Sabbaths. Uh, the marriage of humanity and divinity. We have no idea what that means. We really don't. Because we think that it has to do with the day of the week. We cannot um, at all uh, realize that it's much, much more than a day of the week. It's not only an attitude, but it's a state of mind and a state of heart in communion with our creators our Father and our Mother, Christ, the only begotten Son, and His counterpart, the Holy Spirit Daughter, our Creators. 
our redeemers, our recreators, you see. And giving up our work, what we think we need to do so that we can be accepted or be made perfect. They did it all. Remember, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. There's nothing that you can do of yourself that's going to make the Sabbath any more holy or any better. The Lord hallowed it. The Lord made that day. And he made it a day of rest where you learn to not do anything but be in the presence of God. Be in the presence of your father and your mother, your creators. And let them love you. And you love them. You don't need to do anything special you understand it's already been done it's already done when i used to go to my mother's house to visit you know and they they would invite me they would ask me to come and i would come and uh well she'd prepare a meal for me and she would fix what i loved the best and uh you know she would just honor me and uh um, make me feel at home like i never had gone you understand and always make me feel like they want me to stay and never go you see uh, that's what it means to keep the Sabbath it's coming home just falling in the arms of your father and your mother and just saying I'm back it's been hell out there but I'm back thank you for having a place for me a place in time and a place in eternity the eternal Sabbath rest and this is what they were trying to deny brother hot when they were condemning him for marrying sister hot it's no wonder the Davidians haven't progressed with truth or with light they certainly haven't gathered 144,000 either after all these years, they still haven't gathered the 144,000. And of course, they're not the 144,000 either. When Florence Hodiff disbanded the association that needed to be left alone, disbanded. Because what you have now are offshoots of that root. And none of them are bearing fruit. None of them are bearing fruit. Because they're not meant to bear fruit. The truth that has the Holy Spirit, the message and movement that has the Holy Spirit, the tree of life, is the only one that's going to bear fruit. Not Jesse, not the rod, but the branch. That's the only one that's going to bear fruit, and it has to be a female branch grafted in to a withered branch or a rod, and it gives it life, and it brings forth fruit. We need to look at God's order. We need to look at what God was doing through the prophets of the Advent movement. And we need to understand that every one of them was married because it represented the Protestant parsonage. And they were also in the image of Christ and the Holy Spirit who are to be married as well. Because Adam and Eve were married. And if they're going to restore the first dominion to mankind, that means a man and a woman married and wearing the righteousness of Christ which is the glory that Adam and Eve lost after they sinned that's what we're being restored to and when they lost that glory they were cast out of the garden 
because when they were in the garden, they were resting and keeping the true Sabbath. Do you understand? Outside the garden, you can't keep the true Sabbath. You can keep a Sabbath, but it's not the true Sabbath. It's not the true Sabbath until the divinity and humanity are married once again. That's the true Sabbath, true Sabbath rest. What we have now is not the true Sabbath. It's an image of it, but it's not the true Sabbath, true Sabbath rest. It might even be a counterfeit of it, but it's not the true Sabbath rest. So we need to understand what the Lord has led us through, through the wilderness of sin, so that he can bring us into the kingdom. All these doctrines that we've had as he leads us to the kingdom have been polluted doctrine. He can't give you the pure doctrine when you're in the wilderness. He brings you into the land. He sprinkles you with clean water. He takes away your stony heart, gives you a heart of flesh. He puts his spirit within you and causes you to walk in his ways and keep his statutes and judgments. That's when you're going to have the true Sabbath. And the only one that has that garment change, I understand, is um, the one that the Lord has anointed and appointed, the Joshua of today. And if he doesn't have it, if you think he doesn't have that garment change, well, then you don't have it either. That's what the spirit of prophecy says. That's what the Lord says. So if you don't think he has it, you don't have it either. And you have no right to judge another man's servant especially the servant of the Lord, nor his wife, nor his family. May the Lord uh, give us uh, understanding. And may we repent and stop judging, especially God's servant. Amen.